welcome to This Week in Video Games, episode 104. My name is Tom Kershaw and this is a podcast all about the world of video games. Well, this week I've been playing the new speedrunning FPS Neon White. And this definitely is one of the hottest games out there at the moment. I've also been checking out the latest Nintendo Direct Mini Partner Showcase and also gathering all the info that we have about Breath of the Wild 2. All that, plus I've been checking out some great indie games, and I've got my hands on my new Steam Deck, so I'll be bringing you my review of that later on in the show. Well, it's a busy show as always, so let's get to it! Well, welcome to the show everyone, I hope you're well and you're having a good week! Yeah, I'm good this week, and Nintendo were back this week with their Nintendo Direct Mini Partner Showcase. And yes, that is a mouthful. Uh, showing off some of the third-party games coming to Nintendo Switch later on in the year. Now, overall, it was a really, really good show. Maybe even one of the best when it comes to partner mini showcases. However, we didn't get any first-party news, and some fans are very, very hungry for news related to Breath of the Wild 2, Metroid, Splatoon, and also Bayonetta 3. Now, later on in the show, I'm going to be rounding up everything we know about Breath of the Wild 2, Hopefully that will tide us over till the next Nintendo Direct. Plus I'm going to be going over the Nintendo Direct Mini Partner Showcase news as well. Well, talking about exciting news, I also got my hands on my Steam Deck. So I've been testing that out loads and I have to say, this is one of the best pieces of video game hardware out there. So we've been really lucky over the last few years with the PS5, the Xbox Series S next, and the Nintendo Switch OLED edition. But this piece of new hardware could be could be the best of the bunch. I'm going to review the Steam Deck later on. Well, before we get into it, it'd be great if you could leave a review over on Apple Podcasts. really helps the podcast get more eyes on it. Now, I do have a link in the podcast description. So if you like the show and you want to leave a review, I would really, really appreciate it. Plus, I'll read out the review on a future episode of the podcast. Also, if you want to support the show further, check out This Week in Video Games on Patreon and check out all those Patreon benefits. Okay, that is my waffly intro over, but let's check out what I've been playing this week. Well, this week I've mainly been playing Neon White. You know, this one is a fantastic new game. One which really didn't capture my attention when it was first announced, but the gameplay does a great job of hooking you almost immediately. I've also been checking out a couple of indie games too, by the name of Loot River and Iden Chronicle Rising. You know, both can be found on Xbox Game Pass and are definitely worth checking out. Loot River, in particular, is a really interesting mix of genres. It's kind of like a roguelike Metroidvania that mixed with Tetris. It's really, really good fun. Well, first of all, let's get into the game that's been taking up most of my attention this week, and that one is Neon White. Well, Neon White is a first-person speedrunning shooter slash melee game from Ben Esposito. It couldn't be more different from Donut County, however it's grabbed the attention of the mass as a likely top 10 candidate for Game of the Year discussions. Now, if you strip back all the layers of Neon White, it's essentially a speedrunning FPS game. You know, I heard the words Debt Builder thrown in there when I've heard other people talking about the game, but I don't really think it is a Debt Builder, more of an item collector. You know, the idea is to get from A to B in the fastest time possible, killing all the demons that get in your way. Our main protagonist is White, and it's up to White to kill all the demons that somehow made their way to heaven before Judgment Day. At this point, it's worth noting that the game is very anime, so if you like this kind of thing, then you're probably going to love Neon White. Personally, I don't really think the story side of things is for me when it comes to Neon White, but it's there if you do want to engage in it. If not, it's easily skippable. Neon White does have a deep story though, fleshed out characters and some excellent writing. I can definitely appreciate the work that's gone into it, however, I don't really think the story is for me. The gameplay is the real hook, and it's fast, it's fluid, the game feels great, and Neon White gives me satisfaction from a gameplay perspective. When it comes to the narrative, I just didn't really engage with it. And the narrative pauses stop me from getting to the action as quickly as possible, and while it isn't for me, you know, it may be for you, and that is absolutely fine. It kind of reminded me of Hades, which had the combination of fantastic feeling gameplay and a compelling narrative, and Neon White has a similar winning combination. 
Well, the game is all about speed, and the idea is to get from the start, navigate the course, the walls, the enemies, and get to the finish line as quickly as you can. Along the way, you can pick up soul cards. They give you access to a range of weapons and bonuses, and they help you create a build to maximise your speed in getting to the finish line. For example, you can gather a card which will give you a weapon, and you can use that to shoot up enemies from your path, or you can spend the card to do a dash across a gap. So there's a nice little risk-reward element to the power-ups. The overall feeling of the game is very, very good. So I've been playing this on a combination of Steam Deck and PC, and it feels great in both modes. The motion in the game is awesome, although if you do get sick from first-person games, this one might be one to keep an eye on. You know, personally, I didn't get that here with Neon White, but I have heard of some players feeling that way. It's also very balanced. You know, it could quite easily veer into feeling overpowered due to the weapons and the cards, but the development team, they've done a great job of balancing the game overall. So paired with the great feeling of the combat and the motion is the level design, and Neon White is some of the best level design we've seen in 2022, with deceptively simple levels at the start moving slowly up through the gears of complexity as you make progress. Each level is a puzzle. It may appear to be straightforward and simple. As you replay levels to get faster times, you realise there's layers of complexity perhaps you didn't notice the first time round, or maybe even the second time round. And this is helped by the speed-running leaderboards. When you see them, you see other people's times, you know there must be a shortcut that you haven't found yet. Levels signpost where to go, but not in the most obvious ways with a big red arrow. The level design is very natural and the landscape will tell you where to go where the enemies are placed, all giving you the clues as to the most efficient route through a level. You know, what the game doesn't teach you are the secret paths through the levels, and the speedrunning tricks are going to help you shave multiple seconds off your times. Well, Neon White is meant to be run through at pace. I had a little introduction to speedrunning with Super Mario Odyssey. I spent a little bit of time speedrunning that game when it came out in 2017, and I was streaming on Twitch at the time. You know, I didn't really have incredible times, I think my fastest time for speedrunning the whole game was about 1 hour and 30 minutes. But, you know, you get to know your routes, your splits, plus you know when a run is done. Summer Games Done Quick is something worth checking out if you want to get into speedrunning. It's more than likely the game you love will have been the focus of a speedrun at some point. And by the way, Summer Games Done Quick has just been on. I think it completed this weekend, but they do have a really, really good archive of all their speedruns, and they're really, really impressive, so definitely recommend checking it out. Neon White is built for speedrunning. It's going to be great to see the pros get into it at some point. The social aspect of Neon White is awesome too. You can see your friends' times, and that gives you huge motivation to beat them. So while the game is all action, the gameplay for me is the main draw of the game, there is also a story too. So you've got three other Neons, so these are beings tasked with killing demons, alongside the protagonist Neon White. However, White has lost his memories and has to get them back. This can only be done by getting gifts in the levels and giving them to the other Neons. So you've got Red, Yellow and Violet. These lead to side quests where you can have levels with specific challenges, cutscenes and also memories. So the memories aren't always happy affairs though, so do be warned. Neon White tackles a pretty hard-hitting subject, and that is abuse. So I'm really lucky and don't have personal experience with this topic, and long may that continue. However, I do think it's good that games can tackle these hard-hitting topics, and bring these difficult conversations to the forefront. Although I wasn't personally engaged with the story, I do think it is a positive side of gaming. Much like Celeste talked effectively about mental health, hopefully Neon White can do the same here. Well, Neon White is a standout game for me in 2022. The gameplay mechanics are so fluid and smooth, plus they feel great. You can decide whether or not you want to engage in the narrative. You know, either way, I think it's fine. But there's no arguing that Neon White has some of the best gameplay of the year so far regarding pure fun. If you like first-person shooters and you love a little bit of speedrunning, this one is going to be a match made in heaven. And if you haven't tried speedrunning before, I definitely recommend trying this. It's managed to get its hooks into a lot of people, and you could be next. It was developed by Angel Matrix and Ben Esposito. It was published by Annapurna Interactive. It's available on PC, Nintendo Switch, and also the Steam Deck. It was released on the 16th of June, 2022. Well, that is it for now for Neon White. This is absolutely fantastic. Really, really good stuff. So it is on sale on Steam as of the making of this podcast. So definitely recommend going to pick it up. Well, that is it for now for Neon White. But next up, let's have a look at that Nintendo Direct Partner Mini and see what Nintendo had to say. Well, 
Well, earlier this week, Nintendo Direct highlighted an array of third-party games coming to Nintendo Switch throughout the rest of the year and beyond. So, as expected, the showcase focused on games made by non-Nintendo companies, but there were still plenty of highlights and several exclusives. The show kicked off with Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak, and that launched at the end of last week. So an update with yet more monsters arrives in August. So that is really, really something to look forward to. Plus, you've got a demo available now. Next was the announcement about Nier Automata. Platinum Games acclaimed role-playing game from 2017. And that is headed to Nintendo Switch via a fresh The End of Your edition. And that contains previous DLC and new costumes. And that one launches on the 6th of October. The surreal puzzle adventure Lorelei and the Laser Eyes. That's an Annapurna published indie coming first to consoles in 2023 via Nintendo Switch. Then we had Super Bomberman R2. That's a fresh Bomberman game coming to Switch next year with up to 15 people can play together. There's also a stage creator mode too. Well, next up was a big announcement. So the Mega Man Battle Network Legacy Collection is a compilation of 10 classic Mega Man games from the Game Boy Advance era Come to Switch in 2023. There's also an art gallery and music mode with more than 150 songs from across the series. Digitally, it's going to be available split into two volumes, Volume 1 and Volume 2. Next up, there's a remake of the puzzle classic Pac-Man World. It's called Pac-Man World Repack, and it launches for Nintendo Switch on the 26th of August. Well, Blanc is an arty monochromatic adventure free of text starring a fawn and a wolf cub who must work together to find a way across a snowy wilderness. It's described as an emotional adventure and has both local and online co-op play. It's a console exclusive to Switch and arrives in February 2023. Monkey Island creator Ron Gilbert's return to Monkey Island, which indeed he is after a very long wait, is going to launch first on consoles via Nintendo Switch. And there's still a vague 2022 launch date for this one. We thought we might see a Mario and Rabbid Sparks of Hope release date confirmation after the leak, and indeed, we now have one. The game is going to launch on the 20th of October, is now officially confirmed, and we got a look at the new trailer, which revealed Bowser as a playable part of your squad. Next up, there's a big montage of games, so chibi roguelike Little Noah, Sign of Paradise launched on the Switch eShop, that launched already last week. Train Management Sim Railgrade arrives this autumn, an RPG time, The Legend of Right is another promising puzzler, set in a notebook and is due on the 18th of August. And we got another look at Sonic Frontiers, which is out in time for Christmas. A brief look at the game's cyberspace zone provided glimpses of challenges you'll take on at supersonic speed to grab keys and progress further. Then there's some other games we knew about already, the previously revealed Disney Dreamlight Valley that launches on the 6th of September via Early Access. Square Enix's Live Alive, already confirmed for launch on the 22nd of July. Doraemon Story of Seasons launches later this year, whilst action strategy spin-off Minecraft Legends is due in 2023. Dragon Quest Treasures, a spin-off starring Eric and Mia from DQ11, was dated for release on the 9th of December. And one last montage showed off other known quantities, Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes, that's available now. No Man's Sky, 7th of October. A Plague Tale Requiem, the cloud version, that is on the 18th of October, and Captain Velvet Meteor, the Jump and Dimensions, that is coming on the 28th of July. The Portal Companion Collection, a, a compilation of both Portal 1 and Portal 2, is available now on Nintendo Switch, and Valve's excellent first-person puzzle platforming has previously been announced for Nintendo's handheld, but today's launch is a surprise. Multiplayer mode fans take note, you can also play Portal 2 in local, split-screen and online co-op mode too. Harvest Stella, a Final Fantasy-style take on Stardew Valley, was announced by Square Enix. There's fields to farm, townsfolk to befriend and beasties to slay, as you might expect. So there's also something very ominous called the Season of Death, which you should avoid. That one arrives on the 4th of November. Well then, at the end of the showcase, we got the announcement that loads of Persona games are coming to Nintendo Switch. Well, finally, we have the Persona Collection coming to Nintendo Switch. Really, really exciting stuff. And a big thank you to Tom Phillips from Eurogamer for that report. Well, that is it for this look at the Nintendo Direct Mini Partner Showcase. So in terms of Partner Directs, I think that one was really, really good. But I know Nintendo fans are really hungry for news about first-party games, including Breath of the Wild 2. So to tide us over until that next Nintendo Direct, I've gathered everything that we currently know 
about Breath of the Wild 2. So next up, let's have a look at all that juicy information. The highly anticipated sequel to Breath of the Wild is currently scheduled for spring 2023, and that's potentially just under a year away. However, we know surprisingly little about the game, other than it's a direct sequel, something that's quite rare when it comes to Legend of Zelda games. Well, today I'm going to be diving into everything that we know so far about the Breath of the Wild sequel, you know, picking apart all the details from the trailers, plus we're going to have a look at some of the best speculations that we have so far. Well, to look at everything that we know about Breath of the Wild 2, we're going to be looking at the trailers so far, but also snippets of interviews with key staff from Nintendo. So the obvious place to start is with the trailers themselves. We've had three so far, the E3 2019 in-development announcement trailer, the E3 2021-2022 release date trailer, and then we had the delay trailer in early 2022. You know, hopefully we are going to get a new trailer from Nintendo during the summer of 2023. Hopefully we're going to find out loads more details about Breath of the Wild 2. But as of publishing this video, then we don't have that detail at the moment. But as soon as we do, rest assured we will be making a new video about it and discussing it in the community. Well, let's start out with the first trailer from E3 2019. So Link and Zelda, they're underground. We assume this is under Hyrule Castle. As Link and Zelda make their way through the caves, we see some green magic spirals making their way upwards. Link and Zelda pass wall paintings that appear to depict a character on horseback that could be Ganondorf himself. He appears to be on the back of a horse with a weapon in his hand, and Zelda is sitting on top of a huge animal, you know, elephant in size, although bison by design, and then Link and Zelda continue forward into the caves, presumably in search of the green magic. Zelda's hair is notably shorter since the original Breath of the Wild, which has led some fans to speculating whether she's a playable character, no confirmation of this at the moment, but many fans are hoping for this to be true. And you can also see the Master Sword strapped to Link's back, and for a moment we see a shadowy figure seemingly trapped at the bottom of the green energy. So the scenes in the trailer change very rapidly. Red and black tendrils reach and engulf the steps, killing a rat in their path. Link and Zelda make their way over a bridge. Zelda raises a torch to reveal a shocking sight in front of them. The green spiralling magic is attached to what looks to be an arm, an arm holding a dusty corpse in place, with the corpse looking like it could be Ganondorf himself. This mysterious green arm appears to be holding back a dark magic emanating from Ganondorf's corpse. You can see a shining jewel set in the centre of this being's head, similar to Royal Gerudo that we've seen before. So we then have some quick cuts in the trailer. Link's right arm appears to absorb some light and he clutches it, looking panicked. The black and red tendrils shoot upwards, presumably towards Hyrule Castle. And then we see a flash of an image of what could be a dungeon, leading to many speculating that dungeons could be making their return after their absence in the original Breath of the Wild. The scene then switches to Hyrule, we see the castle rising up into the sky, the trailer finishes up with the text saying Breath of the Wild 2 is in development, and that would be all we would hear for the next two years, up until 2021. So there's a couple of things that we should note in this first trailer, so it looks like Ganondorf appears to be trapped by this green magic, Although we haven't got confirmation that this is Ganondorf yet, that is just presumption at the moment, and the symbols in the green magic seem to have some significance. Hyrule Castle floats up into the sky, Link appears to have been attacked or has been affected somehow by some magic on his right arm, as he's seen in some distress, clutching at his arm in a flash of light. Nintendo also appears to be hinting at dungeons making a return, with a big dark looming doorway there shown for a few seconds, so it's all really, really interesting stuff, so let me know down in the comments what you think all of this means. Well, next up, let's move on to the second trailer from E3 2021. So this was really, really exciting. So the trailer starts with the corruption, or the black and red smoke reaching up once again. In a split second, we see Link wearing his blue champion's tunic. He's reaching for his arm, seemingly under attack from some magic or from some dark force. Ganondorf's corpse screams, now he's clearly moved on from the last trailer when he was being held in place and only opened his eyes. Now he's awake and he's screaming, plus he looks angry too. The corruption, or the black and red mist, continues to grow and reach, though we don't know what it is at this point. You know, evil is escaping, that's for sure. And then we see Princess Zelda falling backwards into a pit or into the depths, although it's not really clear whether this is a dream or a flashback of some kind or actually happening 
in the underground caves. So then we have a massive change of scene and a change of tone for the whole trailer. So Link falling from the sky, you know, he's skydiving, much like we've seen before in Skyward Sword. Pieces of Hyrule appear to have risen from the ground and now suspended in the sky, and Link himself looks different. His hair is longer, his right arm is looking strange, and he's not wearing the blue tunic anymore, he's wearing some kind of half tunic. So this new Link is then shown gliding down to Hyrule, and now he's running up a hill, he's got a shield, he's got a bow, he's got some arrows, and above you, you can see the pieces of Hyrule land suspended once again in the sky. And then a new mechanical enemy appears with a new symbol on its stomach or on its midsection, and then a stone talus rises from the ground with bokoblins on it running off the top. We then get a close-up of Link's right arm, and his nails are really long, and his arm is encased with bracelets or something keeping the arm in place, so it looks more than decoration. It's not really clear where this arm has come from. Is this the same arm that was holding Ganondorf in place, or is this actually Ganondorf's arm? Or is it somehow Zelda's arm? Now, my money is on the arm that was holding Ganondorf in place, but that doesn't account for the longer fingernails. We then switch to a new scene with the blue champion's tunic wearing Link. He's got new abilities. He appears to be able to manipulate physics or time by throwing a big spiky ball back up a hill. That looks similar to some stasis powers from the first Breath of the Wild. But we haven't seen the Sheikah slate just yet. You know, either the slate has been given an upgrade or we've got new powers from somewhere else. So Link is then seen with a flamethrower with an attachment on his left arm. So it looks like Link is going to be using his arms for new abilities. He's got a flamethrower here on his left, and then later on we see that different looking Link with a new tunic, the longer hair, his corrupted arm, crucially, is his right arm. We then see a very mysterious scene with a water droplet going in reverse, and Link appearing to be able to travel through concrete. Link seems to be able to jump up into the ceiling and travel through an ancient structure. It's not really clear if Link is going in reverse or if he's travelling through the concrete. This is the Link with the strange arm and the long hair rather than the previous blue champion tunic wearing Link. So it is all very, very confusing. I'm looking forward to some clarification from Nintendo. But let me know down in the comments what you think is going on here. You know, why have we got two Links? Are we going to be able to travel back through time or is this second Link even Link at all? Well, finally, we've got another wide shot of Hyrule, and we see Hyrule Castle floating into the sky with the corruption escaping beneath it. The strange music playing in the background. Nintendo tease us by giving us a 2022 release window, though that would be delayed in 2022 itself, back to spring 2023. So from this trailer, there's a whole bunch of new information. We see more than one link, and we don't know if we're going to operate them at the same time, or if there's a transition from one time period to another. So we've played as young Link and adult Link in past Legend of Zelda games. This doesn't look like a young or adult version. So both look like adult versions, but one seems to be altered in some way. You know, one's haggard with longer hair and arm either injured or possessed in some way by that corruption. We see much more of the sky in this trailer as well. So Link diving from the sky, very reminiscent from Skyward Sword. Plus we get to see the fragments of Hyrule in the sky leading much to believe that gameplay is going to be extended to those islands, and that would be later confirmed by IG Enuma himself. We also get a better look at Link's arm in this trailer, and its significance in Breath of the Wild 2. It looks like it's been possessed or taken over, and this may give Link some new powers, similar to that of the Sheikah Slate from the original, but we've only seen snippets, and Link's arm is the significant development here, and it's going to be really interesting to see how this one plays out. Well, next up, we've got the most recent trailer, and that is from March 2022, so sadly known as the Delay trailer. Now, the main bulk of this trailer is IG and Numa announcing the delay and apologising, so no worries, Anuma, we want it to be ready, and you can just take your time. The gameplay replays the reverse droplet going into the concrete with Link appearing to travel through solid rock. Then we see Link standing, our new Link with longer hair, and the strange arm, and he's standing in front of a glowing orb. Link then reaches behind and grabs the Master Sword, but it appears to be broken or corrupted. You know, it's glowing blue and seems to be responding to the glowing orb in front of him. Link's hand is also glowing with a symbol on the back of his hand, and a symbol that isn't the Triforce, it's a yellow glowing glyph of some kind. Now, these colours do have significance in past Zelda titles. Blue has represented magic, but also the wisdom part of the Triforce, which has historically belonged to Princess Zelda. 
Water, the Zora, Nehru have all used the blue colour, but most significantly blue has been attached to Zelda, so there could be a little clue in there. Fee from Skyward Sword has also been represented by the colour blue, so the yellow colour is slightly more tricky to place, given the other Triforce colours have been represented with red and green. This trailer was very short, but also appears to contain some important information, so the state of the Master Sword is absolutely shocking, and perhaps the bulk of our quest could be to repair it. There is some significance in the blue of the glowing colour on the sword, and also the yellow glowing on it too, and the two elements appear to be responding or reacting with one another. Other than the trailer, we know from interviews with IG Al Numa, this is going to be a direct sequel to Breath of the Wild, and given they had so many ideas from the original Breath of the Wild, and they didn't want to put them into DLC, and it's going to be a continuation of the story, and also the game is being directed by Hidemaro Fujibayashi, you know, the same director who took the reins for the first game. Fujibayashi apparently took inspiration from Skyrim from Breath of the Wild, although interestingly, many younger members of staff have been playing Red Dead Redemption 2 throughout the development of Breath of the Wild 2. How or if that inspiration is going to appear in the sequel, that is yet to be known. Well, that is everything we know about Breath of the Wild 2, and we really are star for information about first-party titles from Nintendo, so hopefully they're going to be back later on in July or September with a first-party update. Well, that is it with everything that we know from Nintendo for now, but next up, let's have a look at the all-platform charts. Well, number 10 this week, up three places from last week's number 13, it's Grand Theft Auto 5. And number 9 this week, up three places again, from last week's number 12, it's Animal Crossing, New Horizons. Holding steady at number 8, it's Minecraft. And then number 7, down one place from last week's number 6, it's Pokemon Legends Arceus. And number 6, down two places from last week's number 4, it's Nintendo Switch Sports. And number 5, down three places from last week's number 2, it's Lego Star Wars The Skywalker Saga. At 4 this week, it's Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, up one place from last week's number 5. And number 3 this week, holding steady at number 3, it's Mario Strikers Battle League Football. At number 2, down one place from last week's number 1, it's Horizon Forbidden West. And fresh in at number 1, it's a new entry. It's another new one from Nintendo, and this one is Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes. So again, congrats to Nintendo for dominating the top 10. They got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 70% of the top 10 is currently held by Nintendo. That is absolutely fantastic work from Nintendo. And you can see the dominance of the Nintendo Switch playing out there in the charts this week. Well, slightly related to the Nintendo Switch, Valve have come out with their own handheld console, the Steam Deck. And I finally got my hands on my Steam Deck a couple of weeks ago. And this is a new console I've been looking forward to probably even more than the PS5 and the Xbox Series X. The fact you can hold your Steam library in the palm of your hands is really, really good. Basically, I bought this thing and it instantly had about 100 games to play. So it's very, very impressive. Well, without further delay, let's go over to my review of the Steam Deck and let's dive into it. Well, the Steam Deck was announced back in 2021. And if you were lucky enough to get an order in early, you may be holding one in your hands at this very moment or be looking forward to a Monday when Valve sends out their pre-order emails. I was one of those lucky people and have been getting to know the Steam Deck over the past few weeks. Nintendo has dominated the handheld console gaming market since 2017 with Nintendo Switch and even before then with iterations of the Game Boy and the Nintendo DS. I do think that is about to change though as now you can hold your whole Steam library in your hands, play it on the train, on the plane, on your couch or even in bed. Well, The Steam Deck is one of the most anticipated pieces of gaming hardware in years and most of the time, it lives up to that billing. This is a handheld PC, and it outperforms the Nintendo Switch in many ways. Plus, you can play true current-gen games like Final Fantasy Remake Integrade, Elden Ring, God of War, Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak, and also Apex Legends. Well, the Steam Deck is a mini PC through and through. Natively, it runs a Linux-based Steam OS. But if you want, you can load up Windows on it and take advantage of all the benefits there. For what I'm using it for, a mobile gaming platform where I'm focused on my Steam library, 
The Steam OS is just fine for me at the moment. So if you like to take these things apart and tinker, then the options are definitely there for you. However, it pretty much turns on and ready to play with minimal setup other than signing into your Steam account. Well, the Steam Deck runs a good portion of Steam games with some big hitters like I mentioned before, and playing Elden Ring in the palm of your hand just feels incredible. It's something out of the kid version of myself's dreams. However, it doesn't play all the games I have in my Steam library, Destiny 2 being the main missing game, and I believe this is something to do with the anti-cheat software running on my PC, but I could be wrong. You know, long story short, Steam Deck isn't compatible with every game on Steam yet, and there is still a long way to go, but there are a lot of games on there, and Steam does give you an easy way of navigating the Steam games that are available and great on deck, as they call it. You know, some games are verified to work on Steam Deck, some work fine, and some have some issues. Some don't work at all, and hopefully Valve will be working towards getting everything on there in the coming months and years to come. Well, the handheld console itself is pretty big. It's not too heavy, though, and it does feel chunky in the hands. This is especially noticeable if you play with a Nintendo Switch for a time and then move to the Steam Deck, you're going to notice it instantly. It's 11.7 inches from one end to the other, which is 2 inches bigger than the Nintendo Switch. It's much heavier, too. You know, Valve has done a great job with the product design. It does feel good to hold. But it's not quite as stylish as the Nintendo Switch, especially the OLED model. But while it lacks in hardware design, it makes up for in power and hardware capability. Well, the screen is LCD and runs at 1200 by 800 60 hertz and looks very, very good. The screen doesn't pop as much as the OLED Switch, but the graphical fidelity is excellent, plus the games can run at 60 frames per second. So on the left-hand side, you do have a D-pad, plus you've got a left thumbstick and a touchpad that can be used as a mouse. On the right-hand side, you've got the face buttons, the standard A, B, X, Y configuration, similar to a modern Xbox controller. The buttons feel really good to press, and overall the controls are comfortable, whether you're using the D-pad or the thumbsticks. As well as the standard directional controls, you've also got gyro controls in there too, which is particularly good in neon white if you're speedrunning to the finish line. The track pads are a nice feature as well, which offer a little haptic feedback when you touch them. The track pads are often used instead of a mouse. They do a good job of mimicking the mouse feel, which is great on a handheld device. I found myself not using the track pads too much in my time with the console so far. The standard sticks and the D-pad are good in terms of navigating the menus or playing games. And the controls are finished with the L1 and R1 button, plus you've got the L2 and R2 triggers, and you've got additional paddles on the back. In terms of other ports and controls, you've got the USB-C port on the top of the console, plus you've got the volume, plus you've got the volume controls there as well. There's a fan which is constantly cooling the machine and working overtime. You know, it always seems to be on, but this makes sense. Given the complex miniature nature of the hardware in your hands, that needs to be temperature controlled all the time. The Steam Deck also has performance monitoring built into the software, so you can see the GPU and the CPU temperatures, the frame rates and the memory, and also the core use as well. Regarding the interface, it looks and behaves in a very similar way to the Steam Desktop app. It's easy to navigate and everything is clearly labelled, plus you've got a nice Steam button on the actual Steam Deck itself, and that will bring you up a useful quick access menu. There's a couple of versions of this first iteration of the Steam Deck available. It comes in 64GB, 256GB and 512GB models. I went for the 256 model, the middle option, given the 64GB option didn't seem big enough for a modern game library. This can easily be extended through a micro SD card. You can add up to 2TB extra, which should be more than enough for a short while. And you can also upgrade the SSD inside the machine if you're more technically minded, although it's not something I will be getting into myself. Load times on high performance games like Elden Ring or The Witcher 3 can be fairly sizable, taking up to a minute in some cases. You know, game loading also takes a fair amount of time. If you mainly play indies like Neon White, Hades or Celeste, then load times probably won't be an issue. But for bigger games like Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, you're probably going to notice the load times much more. So here's some of the games I've been enjoying on the Steam Deck so far. So Oli Oli World, a side-scrolling skateboarding game which feels like it was made for the Steam Deck and mobile play. I've been playing plenty of Neon White, the new speedrunning FPS game that is currently taking the world by storm, plus also a breakout indie hit of 2022 in Vampire Survivors. 
I dabbled in a few Steam Next Fest demos too, like Cult of the Lamb, Old Skies and Midnight Fight Express. I've also bought The Witcher 3, Jedi Fallen Order and Portal 1 and 2, but I haven't got into those latter games just yet. You know, all of them are rated great on deck, so I'm looking forward to getting stuck in when I'm away for work next week, and also the following week when I'm travelling on a plane, I intend to put this thing through its paces. The battery life does have some issues, it doesn't last very long, and the battery runs down even when plugged in whilst playing some games. This console just eats battery energy at an incredible rate. You're only going to get a few hours of play even from a full battery. You know, at the moment, this thing isn't going to be suitable for a long plane journey unless you're plugged in and you take some breaks. A big feature that's missing from the moment is optimization settings that allow you to customise the game's performance and balance that with battery life. You know, ideally, you want a good balance of visual fidelity, performance and battery life, but this is the first iteration of the Steam Deck, and that will give Valve some room to improve. So overall, the Steam Deck is an impressive machine when it works as it should. You know, it plays a lot of games, games that we've never been able to play in handheld before. And it's also going to provide Nintendo with some stiff competition in the mobile space, so hopefully they're going to have to up their game with the Super Nintendo Switch or whatever the Switch Pro is actually called. The fact that I can play my entire Steam library on the go almost turns my Nintendo Switch into a Nintendo exclusive machine only. You know, support for indies has been great on Nintendo Switch, but with Steam Deck's release, it's going to really make me think about where to buy the games, especially given Steam Deck's often as sales and events like Steam's Next Fest. You know, I'm really, really impressed with the Steam Deck overall, and I'm looking forward to taking it out on the road for a full test, and also while travelling. At the minute, I'm happy playing my Steam library on the couch or in bed, and there's absolutely nothing more impressive than playing Elden Ring on the go. If I had to give the Steam Deck a score, I'd probably give it an 8.5 out of 10 at the moment. But I would love to hear what you think when you get your hands on the Steam Deck. Well, that is it for my review of the Steam Deck. Really, really impressive console and can't wait to get more games to play on it. But next up, I want to turn my attention to another indie game, and this one is Ayuden Chronicle Rising. Ayuden Chronicle Rising is an interesting game, so this one is very much a prelude to Ayuden Chronicle 100 Heroes coming next year, but Ayuden Chronicle Rising offers up some entertaining fun, it does switch things up with the combat, and rather than the classic JRPG turn-based combat, you have real-time action. So it may offer up some differences from the main series, but Ayuden Chronicle Rising is a decent RPG that should be judged on its own merits. You know, one of our goals in Rising is to rebuild a town called New Nevea, recently destroyed by an earthquake, and while the town was ruined, it also unveiled a hidden treasure underground. Well, the player takes on the main protagonist, CJ, a scavenger who's looking for this newly uncovered hidden treasure. We have to help the residents of New Nevea rebuild, with some of the materials we find including the metal ore, wood, and other specialist materials. There's a certain element of city building here, but you're essentially on rails in terms of what you build and who you speak to. As you progress through the game, you're going to build up your stamp cards, and you'll earn these by helping residents. So fill out your stamp book, and you'll upgrade it and level it up. Then you're going to bring more people into the town. More people means more opportunities and growth for the town, plus you can exchange stamps at the trading post for items later on in the game. Odin Chronicle Rising takes a Metroidvania approach to exploration, with new areas they're blocked off until you have a certain item or skill that will allow you through. For example, CJ has a double jump, but you can't get this until you've improved the armour, you know, given it needs to be lighter and able to double jump. In a way, I quite like the realism, you know, I'm not really coming into a game like this for the simulation aspect, you know, just give me the ability. That aside, the progression feels quite good and on a regular basis, so I didn't really find myself getting bored. Exploration overall is rewarded, and soon you're going to be joined by other party members. You've got Isha, the acting mayor, and Garou. He's a kangaroo mercenary who's just after the contracts and the money. Well, it's easy to swap between party members, given their map to controller buttons for ease of access. Party members allow you to switch up the gameplay style too. So Garou, for example, is tankier, being slower but hitting heavier. Isha has more of a ranged magic approach than CJ, has two pickaxes for close-up melee attacks. This promotes rotating between party members, and the combat overall feels good and varied. You know, keep working your way through the game and the rune lenses become available, 
meaning you can attack with elemental damage. That adds a nice strategic dimension, so given enemies are weaker to fire, electricity and also others too. Elemental stones also block your path, so you're going to need to use a rune lens to unblock your way forward to progress. Well at the start, the combat feels quite basic. Single button attacks are the name of the game, so things feel a little bit repetitive to start with. However, push through that, and the attacks do become a little bit more varied and strategic when you improve weapons and armour. You upgrade your items with the currency and materials, so rising does feel a little bit obtuse when it comes to the number of things locked behind upgrades, and it doesn't help the feeling of the simplicity in the early parts of the game. With a little tweak here and there and the amount that's locked, things could open up a lot more, and the entertainment factor would massively increase. Combat can also be on the easy side, so it might be worth bumping up the difficulty. Yeah, once you've got into the flow though, it's not long before the new Nevea starts to recover and feel like a living, breathing town once again. You have your classic RPG locations, including a blacksmith, a tavern and plenty of NPCs to talk to, who offer up their heartfelt thanks. There's something very rewarding about building back up the town. The quests in the game can feel pretty straightforward, residents asking for materials, you go out there, go and get them and bring them back. But that sense of rebuilding New Nevea is a very good thing, and also very heartwarming too. You know, while the game does tug on the heartstrings successfully, unfortunately the gameplay of missions can get repetitive quite quickly. Main missions feel like a string of fetch quests, and side quests can move into the mind-numbing territory. CJ has to constantly go out and get resources, and while there are fast travel options, it still doesn't make it feel less repetitive, you know, it just makes it feel quicker. One saving grace is the game isn't very long, coming in at about 10 to 15 hours. Considering it's a JRPG, that is a nice neat little contained package. This isn't too surprising considering this is a prelude game, which leads up to the main event next year with 100 Heroes, which will no doubt go back to its JRPG roots for multiple tens of hours worth of gameplay. While repetitive, the game never outstayed its welcome, it's also nice to build up to the next game with 100 Heroes continuing the story of CJ, Aisha and Garou. Aiden Chronicle Rising is a nice change from the regular gameplay tempo of the series. It does a good job of building up the anticipation for 100 Heroes coming next year, plus it's a nice introduction to new players of the franchise. It's a decent adventure that manages to tug on the heartstrings, even though the gameplay can feel a little bit repetitive at times. Well, the game was developed by Natsume, Rabbit and Bear Studios, it's published by 505 Games. It's available on Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4 and 5, Xbox One, Xbox Series S and X, PC, and I reviewed it on PC via Game Pass. Originally, it came out on the 10th of May, 2022. Well, that is it for now for Iden Chronicle Rising. Really nice little game there. But next up, I want to check out another good little indie game, and this one is Loot River. Well, Loot River probably has the best trailer I've seen in games for a long time. The combination of action, classic music, mixed with a little humour, is absolutely perfect. This one is a roguelike with a hint of souls, and it's top-down pixel art, interesting mix of action, adventure, and also Tetris-like gameplay. Loot River is one of those surprising indie games. Yeah, I'd not heard about it before it came out. You are a little character with a sword, and the idea is to progress through a variety of dungeons. The twist is, the dungeons are made of floating tiles. You have to fit these together at the same time as fighting off the enemies. There's plenty of hacking and slashing. You've got souls like parrying and heavy attacks, plus plenty of loot and things to level up like armor and weapons. One false move, you're going to lose it all, so it's really high stakes and often high pressure, and it's also great fun too. You can control the pieces on the floor with a quick tap of the button, Locking the ground into perfect position is only the first step, as you may have to evade an immediate incoming attack. There's enemies of all sizes, ranging from small, annoying enemies to big bosses you really have to worry about. This is a decent combination of two successful genres, plus something different in the roguelite and soul genre, which we have seen a lot of in the past 12 months. Now, moving around the floor tile gives you the ability to choose when to engage in a battle. You have to flip quickly between thinking about fitting the tile into the right place shape, then either go on the offense or the defense quickly, depending on what is in front of you. The tiles offer up something new to fight each time. For example, you can rush in with your tile to a group of baddies, pick them up a couple at a time and then float away to safety. 
you know, Loot River's interesting new mechanics offer up some decent gameplay moments that are fun and challenging at the same time. I am a big fan of games with pixel art, and this does a great job of the art throughout. The main character and the environments are very nice to look at, plus you've got a range of enemies too. They include enemies that throw things at you, enemies with swords, you know, poisonous ones, there's those different types that keep you on your toes. There's also a decent amount of variety with the weapons and the magic. Combine these with artifacts and you've got a decent progression system, and that allows you to level up, grab the currency and build up your character's stats through leveling up. There are specialist items in the game like the feather that teleports you quickly when you've landed a first hit. There's a permanent progression of sorts in the game through magic and weapons that unlock through a currency called knowledge. You can spend your knowledge at the back of the main hub between the levels, but the game doesn't really make it too easy for you because even if you use the knowledge to unlock the weapons and the magic, the game jumbles everything up at the start of a run. You can cash in your knowledge to widen the options, but that is about it. And be careful too, You'll lose any knowledge you haven't spent when you die, so try and spend it as often as you can. Loot River does have its roots in roguelites and souls, and given that fact, it's not a walk in the park. It's a unique game, pulling together elements I wouldn't have thought would work together very well, but somehow the dev team have made it work, and the tiles bring a whole swathe of options to the game. They deliver you new enemies, they sometimes deliver traps, they always seem to deliver new challenges in some kind. You know, all being said and done, Loot River is a decent game which you should check out. It does something new in a genre where often developers walk the safe path, and for that, the game has to be applauded. It doesn't quite do everything right all the time, but then again, not many games do. You know, the artwork is absolutely gorgeous, the audio is really good, and it is a well-rounded package. I checked out the genre on Game Pass for PC. It's one of those maybe I wouldn't have checked out if I didn't have Game Pass, but ultimately I'm glad I did. And I think... You should too. The game was developed by Strecker Studio. It was published by Superhot Presence. It's available on the Xbox PC. And I reviewed this game on PC Game Pass. And it was originally released on the 3rd of May, 2022. Well, that is it for my review of Loot River. Really, really good stuff. But next up, let's look at what we've got coming out in the next few weeks. Well, first up, on July the 7th, we've got Match Point. That is a new tennis game. Going to the PS5, Xbox Series S and X, PS4, Xbox One, Switch and PC. On the 8th of July, it's Arcade Ageddon. That's PS5, Xbox Series S and X, PS4, Xbox One and PC. Also, on the 8th, we've got Kelowna Fancy Reverie Series. That's PS5, Xbox Series S and X, PS4, Xbox One, Switch and PC. Again, on the 8th, we've got Madison, that's PS5, Xbox Series S and X, PS4, Switch and PC. Then on the 12th of July, we've got Time on Frog Island, that is PS5, Xbox Series S and X, PS4, Xbox One, Switch and PC. On the 13th, we've got a really interesting one, it's Loop Monster, recently featured on Steam's Next Fest. That one is available on PC. Then on the 14th of July, we've got a few games, so Escape Academy, that is PS5, Xbox Series S and X, PS4, Xbox One, and PC. We've got Eyes in the Dark, the curious case of One Victoria Bloom, also on the 14th, coming to PC. Then on the 15th, it's Rune Factory 5. That one is coming to PC. Then on the 19th of July, we've got a few games, so As Dust Falls, that's Xbox Series S and X, Xbox One, and PC. We've got Endling, the extension is forever, that's PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC. Also on the 19th, we've got Fallen Angel, that is Switch and PC. Then we've got Into the Breach, that is on iOS and Android via Netflix, that is also on the 19th. Then we've got Stray, that is coming to PS5, PS4 and also PC via the Epic Game Store, also on the 19th. Then on the 21st, we've got Wayward Strand, that is PS5, Xbox Series S and X, PS4, Xbox One, Switch and PC. Finally, we've got Live Alive. That is coming to Nintendo Switch on July the 22nd. Well, that is it for this week's episode, and if you want to get involved in the show in the future, get in contact through patreon.com forward slash This Week in Video Games or check out the latest on the website. You can also check me out on Twitter at TWIVG Podcast. And if you enjoyed this podcast, I've had it useful. Liking and sharing it would really help me out. Otherwise, check out the other podcasts in the feed. Well, thanks again, and I'll see you soon. Thank you.